Hi, my name is Dave Rosenblum. This is Preparation for Board Success. It's a lecture originally created for the ASIP Board Review, and it's designed to help you get those keywords that are frequently missed on the boards. A lot of the content here is based on the curriculum of the various board entities, as well as emails from my Pain Exam alumni informing me of keywords that were missed. Okay, so a little background information about me. I'm the Director of Pain Management at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. I have an office in Great Neck. I've also, of course, done the Pain Exam Board Review, which has helped thousands of pain doctors become board certified, and created the Regenerative Spine course, as well as ultrasound, in-person, and webinar training. Okay, first of all, why get board certified? Okay, just a brief history. I mean, board, board certified pain doctors are not the same as a doctor who says they treat pain. Almost every doctor treats pain. You could be like this guy who goes to a weekend course and thinks he could do epidurals, which is, of course, not advisable, or someone who's actually put in the time. You know, if you didn't do a traditional pain fellowship, there are other legitimate routes to become a pain physician. And you need to make sure, you know, for the patient's benefit as well as for the sake of the specialty that the highest of standards are upheld and therefore that's why we sit for these board exams, that's why we have rigorous training, and that's why entities such as ASIP and the American Board of Interventional Pain Physicians create such strong criteria for getting someone certified in the specialty of interventional pain management. So in 1998, the American Board of Psych and Neurology, the American Board of PM&R joined the American Board of Anesthesiology in recognition of pain medicine as an interdisciplinary specialty. The American Board of Pain Medicine has an exam. The American Board of Interventional Pain Physicians has an exam. The World Institute of Pain has an exam called the FIPP, and the osteopaths also have their pain exams. So just some stats. For pain medicine, you have the American Board of Pain uh, of uh, Physical Medicine Rehabilitation Docs. They issued about 2,000 certificates. The stats for, from September out of the 77 first-time candidates, 83.1% passed, 16.9% failed. Maintenance of certification, you have 63% of the first-time candidates passed and 37% failed. The exam is the same as the American Board of Anesthesiology's exam. It's two two-hour sessions, 20-minute break between sections, four hours of active testing and a tutorial and the break. The American Board of Psych and Neuro used the ABA's exam. They had 18 certificates issued in 2019. The pass rate for MOC was 84%. 90% of the ABA passed the test on first, uh, for primary certification. 75% of the ABPM, is it because the test is harder or because maybe you have more people who've done the fellowship going for the ABA's exam? I don't know. The recertification rate was 84%. So passing the pain boards, you need to have a routine and stick with it. Exercise, diet, research your patients. Look up what you don't know. Or if you want to just review, it's, it's a good way to do that. Talk to other pain specialists about your patients. Maybe you're missing something. Maybe there's something they can teach you because nobody knows everything, right? Even the coders, talk to them. Sometimes they're aware of, of, of policies, especially Medicare's policies, that may be on the boards. Every now and then, you, you may get something like that. Listen to podcast lectures. Of course, I'm not going to mention which podcast I think you should listen to. ASIP, ASRA, et cetera, consensus statements, guidelines. Look up, look up your, um, your blood thinners, uh, when to stop them, when to restart them. ASRA has a great app for that. ASIP has a lot of good guidelines on their website, and especially with the consensus statements for the biologics and the use of pain. That's fair game. That could be on the test. And of course, practice questions, and I'm not going to tell you which questions to practice, but you can imagine what I would tell you. So a Nigerian study um, basically compared cognitive restructuring therapy versus test-taking skills training in the management of anxiety of uh, those undergoing um, tests in southwestern Nigeria. Okay, may not be the same population that we're studying, that are studying for the boards here. However, they found test-taking skills were more effective in the management of anxiety 
than cognition restructuring therapy among participants. They revealed from focus group discussions that inadequate preparation, procrastination, poor testing, test taking skills caused exam anxiety. Of course, I mean, this is obvious, but just it's always good to hear this. You've, you've gone this far in your life, so you obviously know how to study for exams, but um, this is just something to keep in mind. And of course, think and act like a consultant at all times. This is what they're testing you for. They want a consultant. Uh, the same thing they told me with the anesthesia boards, the oral anesthesia boards. Whatever you say, just realize that they're coming to you for advice and they want you to be their consultant. Okay, so here's an email from one of my alumni. I took the exam this past Saturday. I felt your material was overall representative of the exam. The one thing I will say is that there were a lot of questions on the pain scales, but almost every question had options. I included the MMPI and the Beck depression and other scales that were not mentioned often in the review. There's actually a surprisingly high number of questions of pain scales, and I'd say at least one eighth was regarding pain scales in one way or another. That's, that's pretty crazy, one out of eight. I hope he's exaggerating because I, I never heard such a thing. So don't panic about this. Uh, he did suggest that we include more about children in pain. So here's a question. A new patient presenting to a multidisciplinary pain practice states he has a previous diagnosis of failed back surgery syndrome. He is a 57-year-old male who is disabled on oxycodone 30 milligrams Q6 hours. He smokes and appears to follow up regularly for his previous refills. On screening, he asks to be he, on screening, he appears to be low risk for diversion, misuse, and abuse. When asked why he's transferring his care, he states that his previous pain management physician was a jerk and that they got into a fight. I've heard this before. He seems to be angry and mumbles to himself. Which of the following screening tools may help to assess this patient's ability to cope and comply with future therapies? Beck's Depression Inventory, as Westry Disability Index, Minnesota Multifacet pain inventory, and the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. Okay, MMPI, psychological test. It looks for personality traits, psychopathology. It's used for those who are suspected of having mental health or other clinical issues. Remember, this guy displayed psychopathology. He had some sort of fight with his doctor, called the guy a jerk, and he, be, he appeared angry, mumbled to himself. So the answer is C. Okay, so... The MMPI has 567 true-false questions. The newer one, the MMPI 2RF, has less, shorter, and it's widely used. The MMPI A is designed exclusively for teenagers, okay? The MMPI 2 is the one that's still used more. There are dozens of additional content scales that have been independently developed, yet the, the MMPI 2 is really the most common. There's also validity scales to see if the patient is actually putting effort into doing the test or if they're answering honestly. Okay? They may exaggerate or underreport their, their behavior as we sometimes see with the, the NRS, the numeric rating scale of pain. Some people will exaggerate it to get treated differently. Okay, so there are 10 clinical subscales. The first is hydrochondriasis. There may be some vague, nonspecific complaints. The patient thinks that something's wrong. Usually, they're focusing on the back or the abdomen in the face of me negative medical tests. Depression, lack of hope, general dissatisfaction, hysteria, poor health, shyness, cynicism, headache, neur neuroticism, psychopathic deviant, okay? They measure the general social maladjustment and the absence of strongly pleasant experiences. Masculinity, femininity, paranoia, psychasthenia, the inability to resist specific actions or thoughts regardless of their maladaptive nature. This is what we call now OCD. Schizophrenia, it's a scale that measures bizarre thoughts, peculiar perceptions, social alienation, poor familiar relationships, difficulties in concentrating and impulse control, lack of deep interests, disturbing questions of self-worth, self-identity, maybe sexual difficulties, hypomania, okay, elevated but unstable mood, psychomotor excitement, flight of ideas, social introversion, okay. So we've all seen patients with these problems. MMPI could help describe them or identify 
the issues. The Beck Depression Index is a 21 item self reporting scale inventory that measures characteristic attitudes, symptoms of depression. It takes approximately 10 minutes to complete, although clients require a fifth to sixth grade reading level to adequately understand the questions. And you can see based on the numbers here, they rate the depression. Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, the health status measure designed to be completed by patients to assess their physical disability related to lower back pain. This 24 items addressing daily life and physical activities such as personal care, sleep, working, and walking. One point is assigned to each of these items resulting in the total scores of zero to 24. There's Western Disability Index, the most widely probably used uh, of these disability indexes, used by physical therapists to determine functional disability to low back pain. It's simple, quick, and expensive to administer. Modified versions have been developed but the original one has the best measurement properties. The test is often used as an outcome measure for research on low back pain, right? You'll always see that. Now, several questions on research. They didn't ask this year about type one or two errors. EMGs were asked. Questions on PEDS, tricyclics, SSRIs. They love the side effects, interactions, contraindications, and of course, the drug interactions. Pain, shoulder pain, of course. What's muscle energy? Baclofen. Myomine oxidase inhibitors and their withdrawal, pars fracture, and knee pain. So the two homologous, homologous excuse me, enzymes, myomine oxidase A and B, are expressed differently throughout the body and brain. Both are responsible for oxidative metabolism of monomine neurotransmitters. They increase the levels of dopamine, norepi, and serotonin in the brain, regulating behavior, cognition, motivation, and mood. Side effects, weight gain, insomnia, withdrawal symptoms, and food-induced hypertensive episode. The cheese effect, right? This is when there's increased blood pressure related to uh, eating cheese or um, the effect of tranylcypromine. Uh, Sympathomimetic effects, okay, are basically increased blood pressure. Uh, this is from the tyramine that you get in, 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 uh, in, in increased from all these products. Cytochrome P450, the doses of moclobinide needs to be reduced in those who require cimetidine pharmacotherapy because there is a reduced clearance of the drug. Withdrawal presents as agitation, aggressiveness, cognitive impairment, insomnia, paranoid delusions, and slurred speech. These effects were compared to amphetamine specifically because tranylcypromine is structurally related to amphetamine. Further, MAO Inhibitors downregulate sympathomimetic receptors in humans, reducing the catecholamine output. In fibromyalgia, the study showed some release, relief from the pain effects of the disease. However, fatigue and sleep was not improved. Okay, muscle energy technique. Basically, MET is a manual therapy intervention that can be used to strengthen and stretch or lengthen muscles and fascia that lack flexibility. MET requires the patient to create a force by activating the target musculotendinous unit against the precisely direct counterforce applied by the clinician, followed by relaxation and a passive stretch applied to the, by the clinician. One application of MET may consist of three to five contractions held for five seconds each. There is a stretch following each contraction that ranges from three to five seconds to 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, so a 49-year-old diabetic suffers from diabetic neuropathy and myofascial pain syndrome. She has failed to xanity and cyclobenzaprine. One week after instituting baclofen, the patient presents with polyuria, and headaches. Which of the following is most appropriate? A head CAT scan, check the blood glucose, urology consult, or check the ESR. Check the blood sugar. Baclofen is a GABA agonist approved for treatment of spasticity of commonly and is commonly used in the treatment of neuropathic pain and as a muscle relaxant. Intrathecal baclofen can be used for post-stroke spasticity Carbamazepine in con combination with baclofen is efficient and effective in relieving trigeminal neuralgia pain. Baclofen and tricyclic antidepressants can cause muscle weakness. 
Baclofen and monoamine oxidase inhibitors can result in greater depression of brain function as well as low blood pressure. Baclofen can increase blood sugar. You may need to adjust the dose of anti-diabetic medications. Common side effects include fatigue, insomnia, nausea, dizziness, vertigo, and headaches. Thank you. I've enclosed some free resources. Okay, ASIP, ABIP, um, ASRA, these all have great resources. Of course, my free podcasts, my free, uh, the free ver- part of the Virtual Pain Fellowship, we have free links. We have articles on pain exam that go over strategies for taking the boards and how I passed the, the test. NYSORA YouTube Instagram have great, great resources. I post a lot now on Instagram and YouTube. And I also have my newsletter in which I offer free uh, cheat sheets. So if you're not on the pain exam newsletter, please sign up and you'll get the free content. Thank you for joining us and good luck.